comments in the video at a particular timestamp, and I can respond. You know, if you said this here, click, and then I can respond to it. So I'll be actively monitoring that over the next couple of weeks to, to try to provide some follow-up information for you. So yeah, so this one is for the class at Salon, so definitely go on there and join them. Um, these other two are my uh, uh, sites that uh, are kind of based around my concept a little bit. Broadly, uh, more broadly, flipclassroom.org, this is a Ning, it's a professional uh, social media site. So we've got, I think we're rapidly approaching 10,000, we may have already hit that. Um, teachers, educators, sharing ideas on the flipped classroom concept. So um, I was a high school chemistry teacher, I don't know anything about third grade reading. So if you, sorry, those of you who are in here this morning, you need to hear that joke twice. But um, So ask someone there who is a third grade reading specialist, not a high school chemistry teacher, they'll have an answer for you. Learning.org. This is a nonprofit organization that uh, myself and a few colleagues have started recently. Lots of good information there um, in terms of resources, um, research that's emerging. Uh, we just uh, elicited the help of um, two graduate students at George Mason University to do a big lit review research project for us to figure out what's out there right now and what research needs to be done. So we're working on that uh, through that um, organization. Um, let's see. What else is will you find there? Oh, we're doing a bunch of uh, webinars and workshops, and I'll put, uh, post uh, that later on too, but you can sign up for the uh, spot there. All right, you ready to go? Okay. All right, so this is uh, session number two of my, my series today. This morning was just kind of a big picture of what in the world is this thing called the flipped learning, flipped classroom. My story of transitioning from a teacher-centered classroom to a learner-centered classroom, um, letting go of some of the control of my classroom while still maintain, maintaining quality control of content that's delivered. Uh, to, this session is going to be a little bit, bit more kind of nuts and bolts. How do, you, how do you actually pull that off? What kind of software do you use? What are some of the challenges you run into? So I'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. So I have a kind of a tentative slideshow. I mean, this morning I had like 70 slides for 60 minutes, and I was banging through them. Um, I have a lot less this time around, and I would love to keep this as conversational as possible. Um, and I want you guys to just kind of drive where this is going to go, so I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that come up. And I may say hold off and talk about that a little bit, and I may answer it on the fly, just so you know. Um, again, a few of these things will be repeats from this morning, so if you're here, you can just ignore this part. But um, something we should always keep in mind, especially at a big technology conference like this, is that our pedagogy has to drive our technology. Our technology can't drive our pedagogy. So we have to think like good practitioners, good teachers first, and we use technology to, to complement that. We don't buy shiny, flashy things and then figure out how we can um, use those uh, somehow in our classroom. It's, it's really sad when I, when I see people, um, they, they have some fancy, expensive piece of technology put in their classroom and whatever it may be, and then they all of a sudden feel compelled to use it because it's there. And it doesn't fit the way they teach. It doesn't fit this type of class that they teach. And now they just took 20 steps backwards in terms of being a good teacher, trying to use technology that's not going to be useful because somebody just put it in their room. So uh, we need to be careful about that. So hopefully uh, you don't get enamored with you know toys and software and whatnot and stop thinking about good teaching. We always want good teaching to drive in practice. And then secondly is what's the best use of the face-to-face -face, uh, time I have with my students? You only have them for a, a, a few sometimes a few minutes a day, sometimes a few hours a day, and you really need to make to maximize that. Make it make it important, make it meaningful, make it something that kids always want to come back to. So uh, what what are you gonna do that's gonna get the kids to want to come to your class? What's the best use of that time? So those two questions, keep them in the back of your head. Um, real quick, if you're kind of new to this concept, I'll spend a few minutes explaining what this thing called the flipped classroom is. So I think distilled down to a really, really simplistic level, it's what was being done in the classroom is now being done outside the classroom, and what was being done outside the classroom is now being done in the classroom. That's the whole idea of flip. Now, the problem with that is it kind of assumes homework, which is a problem for some people. And if you're here this morning, you talked about some ways you can do this without having to do this as a homework with a homework component, and uh, you can talk to me about that or read some other articles that have been put out recently. But the idea behind Taking large group direct instruction and eliminating that and shifting that into the individual learning space. So a colleague of mine, his name is Ramsey Masson, he kind of phrased it that way best. Taking direct instruction out of the large group learning space and shifting it into the individual learning space. That could be 
in class, out of class, at lunch, at home, at, on the way to the soccer game, before school, after school, during the study hall. It doesn't matter where that happens. It just happens that it's not happening in a, to a large group at the same time. So that's kind of reduced down to its most simplistic level. And I call that flip class 101. Okay? Now, those of you here, who were here this morning saw this video. I'm not going to take the time to show this video because if you go to, whoops, my, my link is there, uh, the shortened URL, the goo.gl, and then the a little bit after it, and I'll, it'll come back up later. That's the Classroom Salon site. Um, and uh, again, this is one of the videos that's up there, and you can watch it there. You can interact with it there, so we're not going to spend time here to do that. But what I do want to talk to, and again, this is still repeat of this morning, and it won't all be repeated this morning, but is uh, approaching our content, approaching the stuff of learning um, using Bloom's Taxonomy as a framework. Okay, now again, this is not revolutionary. This has been around for a long time. This is not the be-all and end-all of learning theory, but it's a good way to kind of approach what we're going to do in the next part of this presentation, and that's take something we need kids to learn and figure out whether or not we are going to use video as an instructional tool to, tool to do that, whether or not we are going to, I love that ring on cell phones. Just the old rotary phone makes me happy. Um, can't, but I can't dance to that one. I like the one I can use. I don't so anyhow, using this as a framework and then um, uh, approaching a learning objective uh, for our classroom, we're going to go through a lesson planning cycle here with the whole concept of flipped learning in mind, whether or not we will use it or not, where will it fit in the, this whole uh, lesson concept. Okay, so I'm kinda, I, I was looking at Blooms about a year ago and thinking, okay, we spent all this time down here and we try to claw our way to the top. Okay? But most of us as educators don't want our kids just remembering and understanding. We want them doing all this higher order stuff, right? So I, I was on an airplane to Oslo, Norway, and I thought I was clever. And I thought, ah, I know. I'll invert Bloom's taxonomy, and I'll make millions of dollars. And I Googled it when I landed, and somebody beat me to it by about a decade. So um, and actually it was what a, a student of uh, Benjamin Bloom, Lauren Anderson, came up with the thought of the idea of, oh, let's make it this way because we want our kids spending our time up here. Because as a pyramid, it assumes that you have to do all this other stuff down here before you can get to the top. But don't really have to do that. There's, and there's lots of articles and research out saying you can really enter at any point to move up and down inside of it, which is why it's not the be-all and end-all. But top-down approach to blooms or bottom-up approach to blooms are just two different ways of looking at this. Now, in terms of entry points, in terms of this kind of this basic flipped classroom concept, watch your video at home, come to class, and we're going to do some work around the concept that you already learned. That is definitely a bottom-up approach because instructional video, teacher-created instructional video, really lends itself to these bottom two tiers of learning. That's the, I mean, this is what you would want to put on a video. If you're putting this stuff on a video, you're robbing your kids of a lot of really good learning that's going on. Okay, we heard a lot about that this morning. Um, I think Dr. Steger would say if you're doing anything in here with direct instruction, you're robbing kids of good learning. I, don't, I happen to disagree with him on that. I think there's a valuable place for direct instruction. I just don't have, think it happens to be to a large group at the same time. So, um, again, go back and watch this morning's session if you want to hear my progression using the flipped classroom as a way to get from a teacher-centered classroom to a student-centered classroom about um, how, how we can create video archives and tap into them. So, if we have students engaged in project-based learning, engaged in creating projects or, or, or um, solving problems, and then we, sit, then we have them tap down into the lower end of blooms when they get stuck. That that I think that's a great place to get because the kid's going to go, and it would be wonderful if we just say, kids, go, learn stuff, collect data, and make conclusions. Well, at some point they need to learn how to run a linear regression in order to analyze their data. You can't just intuitively know how to do a linear regression. You need to be taught that at somewhere along the line. Well, that's a great place to have them tap down. Hey, here's a five-minute video on how to take your data and run a linear regression. Do real procedural, basic stuff, and then whoop, you're back up in your project. I had a student I, um, who uh, wanted to build a fuel cell. She wanted to collect sun, turn that into chemical store, uh, store that energy in, in uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen by electrolyzing water, and then charging her cell phone battery with that with the fuel cell. She got stuck and didn't know about electrochemistry. So she was up here. She goes, "Sam, I'm stuck. I need to learn about electrochemistry." I said, "I got a five-minute video on that. Go watch that. Whoop, watch the video and back up to the top." So we weren't priming the pump with electrochemistry. We were accessing electrochemistry when she needed it. So it's a very different way to approach your learning. So well, what about standards? Well, you can still meet all your standard stuff is cat cataloged down here. And as they're working through their projects, you as a teacher are evaluating their, stu their stuff. You're assessing them. And you're saying, okay, they 
they understand the standard. They don't, I didn't directly instruct it to them or to the whole class, so we didn't all get there at the same time. But guess what? In that project of creating a fuel cell, she learned about the onset chemical equations, some acid base chemistry, some uh, gas laws, uh, electrochemistry, thermal chemistry, all this stuff she's learning within the context of that project. So it's just a different way to approach it. Okay, so lots of different ways we can approach it, but what I want to do is kind of back up and kind of take um, a bottom-up approach, because this is where most of us are at. A lot of teachers are in the bottom-up approach, where I, I, I am still married to content. I have state standards. I have all the stuff. I've been a lecturer for 15 years. I still do a lot of direction instruction. Okay, this is going to be your transition into moving towards other ways. So we're going to take a bottom-up approach. We're going to take a learning objective, and we're going to break it down, and we're going to turn it into a lesson based on uh, some of these principles of flipped learning, using video as an instructional tool for our students. Okay. All right. So a big question as we get there is always that I always get asked, okay, I recorded all my lectures. I got this big old library of videos. Now what do I do? So I'm, not, I'm not doing any direct instruction. I netted 30 minutes a day for my classes or whatever it happens to be, five minutes a day or an hour a day. All that time I got back, and now I know I don't know what to do. Okay, that's a good problem to have, but it's an essential question to ask as well. So, a couple of recommendations is one, learn from your colleagues, learn from experts who are in education. Go to conferences like this. Go to your math teacher, to the math, you know, national math teacher or something, science teacher, go to the national science teacher or whatever. Go to your, go to your content area, grade level area, um, conferences and learn all this great, amazing student-centered stuff to do now that you're no longer clinging to your content. Okay? So that's what you get to do in class. I don't have an answer for a third grade reading teacher. I could probably help you with high school chemistry. That'd be about it. I was a high school chemistry teacher. I forgot to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Aaron. I just moved to Pittsburgh four months ago. I used to teach chemistry. Now I'm building a learning uh, digital learning program for a small graduate school. There, get that out of the way. Okay. Lesson design cycle. Now this is, again, this is not a be all and end all of lesson design cycles. There are a bunch of different ways you can design a lesson. There are a bunch of different ways you can approach standards and all this stuff. I mean, understanding by design, backwards planning, all this stuff. Then you got metal and honey, all this stuff. You got decades and decades of, of ways to approach how to build a lesson. I basically got to go through this process. I don't even know where I got it. I just start typing bullet points. So just go, what do I do when I plan? This is what I do. Okay, so first I start with my learning goal. What do I want my kids to learn? Now that's going to be based on state standards, that's going to be based on my professional experience, that's going to be based on just cool stuff I want my kids to do. Okay? Um, but it's a good place to start because then you can design your assessment based on that. Okay, so this is a little bit of a backwards planning approach. A, 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 um, Again, this is not a be-all and end-all of lesson design cycles. There are a bunch of different ways you can design a lesson. There are a bunch of different ways you can approach standards and all this stuff. I mean, understanding by design, backwards planning, all this stuff. Then you got Madeline Hunter, all this stuff. you got decades and decades of, of ways to approach how to build a lesson. I basically got to go through this process. I don't even know where I got it. I just started typing bullet points. So just go, what do I do when I plan? This is what I do. Okay, so first I start with my learning goal. What do I want my kids to learn? Now that's going to be based on state standards, that's going to be based on my professional experience, that's going to be based on just cool stuff I want my kids to do. Okay? Um, but it's a good place to start because then you can design your assessment based on that. Okay, so this is a little bit of a backwards planning approach, a, 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 um, kind of an understanding by design approach a little bit. But what do I want my kids to learn and how am I going to assess them? Now, if you're here this morning, you know that I'm a big fan of uh, having students prove to me that they've learned it. But most of us are not quite there, so we're just going to talk briefly about assessment. Uh, we're going to go through planning the lesson. Now, this is going to be unique to what I'm going to be talking about. Decide if and where a video is needed. There are some bits of content, some courses, some teachers that are going to lend themselves more so to using more instructional video than others. Okay? If you're a high school chemistry or math teacher, you are probably going to have more instructional content put on video than, say, an elementary teacher. Most of the elementary teachers I know are flipping a lesson here or there, maybe five per year, maybe ten per year. More of the further up you go in terms of uh, age groups, it seems to be more. That's just kind of a trend that I'm seeing. That's not to say you have to do that, it's just what it, that trend that I'm seeing. Okay, then we're going to figure out what we're going to do in class, because we've delivered the direct instruction on video. 
then we're going to plan our video and create the video. I'm really not going to spend a lot of time doing the planning of the video or creating the video, but we'll talk about some tools that you can use to do that and how it's actually pretty simple. Okay? So this is kind of the process I'm going to go through. Um, if you don't have a quiz, you don't have to write all this down. All right. Here's the objective we're going to use. This is just one that uh, my colleague and I put together. It's not perfect. It's just what I have in my classroom. Students will be able to conceptually and mathematically explain Boyle's, Charles, and Gay-Lussac laws. Okay, if you're a high school science teacher, you know what those are. Middle school science teacher, you probably know what those are too. These are gas laws, Boyle's, Charles, and Gay-Lussac. These are laws that relate the concepts of pressure, temperature, and volume. Okay, if I increase the temperature, what happens to volume? If I decrease the volume, what happens to pressure? And all that kind of stuff, okay? That's how they're related, just so you know what the heck I'm talking about. Okay, so if we look at this objective, and you probably have things like this. You either wrote them or your district has them or, you know, learning targets, whatever you want to call them, you've got them out there. And like them or not, that's what you're supposed to teach. So let's break it down. Conceptually and mathematically explain Boyle's, Charles, and Gay Lussac laws. So we really have two objectives for each of these three laws. So almost like six objectives in that one, if we want to break it down. Okay, so let's take it a step further. Let's just look at... Now let's not. We'll do conceptual mathematical. Okay. Who are my science teachers in the room? I know I have a couple. Okay. Conceptually and mathematically, which of those do you think would lend itself better to an inquiry-based approach, and which of those th do you think it might lend itself better to more of a direct instructional approach? Any thoughts? Even if you're not a science teacher, you can check that. Okay. All right. So... Inquiry-based, meaning, you know, investigating something and going through the process of concept development, would probably, yeah, lend itself well to the, to the uh, conceptual understanding. Okay? Versus direct instruction, the mathematical part. Not entire. Again, this is not, these are not hard and fast categories, but for the sake of example today, I think that's a pretty good way to, to, to approach this. So let's do that. Let's plan our lesson assuming that we're going to have students engaging in some sort of inquiry-based activity to understand the concepts of these gas laws, and then we're going to use some form of direct instruction to explain the math. Okay? So we have our objective. Okay, we're going to teach the students in two, the two different components of the objective in two different ways, and then we're going to have some sort of assessment. I'm not going to go into assessment a whole lot today because you all probably have pretty decent assessment tools and that's kind of beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. I want to talk mostly about content delivery and um, using some tools to do that. Okay, so. All right, Ooh, I already asked that and I already asked that. Okay, science teachers, Neil Fett, PHET, this is magical. Let me show you Fett. Um, Okay, this is Fed. PhD. It's out of the University of Colorado. Uh, it's funded by the National Science Foundation. And what they are are some um, science on, uh, online simulations that you can play with. Now, the great thing, here, here's what I like to do. I have a smart board in my classroom. It's on the side of my classroom. So I never present for my smart board because I don't present to the whole class. It's a student workstation over here. What I like to do is I just put these up on the smart board, and they're just there. And the kids walk in and they go, they just walk over. You know what they do? They pump the handle. Right. That's, that's what's great about these. They're real intuitive. Okay. So you uh, grab it. You pump the handle. Oh, look. Okay. So they're going. And, oh, look. Okay. I have some pressure. I have a temperature. That's kind of fun. And then they start playing. Oh, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to increase the temperature. Okay. Oh, I, cool. Oh, look, I increased the temperature and my pressure goes up. Interesting. Temperature goes up, pressure goes up. Yeah, that's fun. So what happens when I, oh, what's this guy do? Oh, ooh, look, it lights up when I so when I mouse over it. Oh, look, I can shrink it. So the volume goes down and the pressure goes up. I wonder if I keep swishing it. Boom! Oh, ah! Blew the lid off. Okay. And so, then they, so what are they doing? They're playing, and they're intuitively learning the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. Pretty simple to do using something like this. Now, 
if you didn't want to do it online, you actually wanted them to engage in like actually manipulating gases, well, guess what? You just put some stuff out for them to explore the relationship between pressure and volume using actual lab stuff. I don't have a lab here, so I'm using this one. Um, good. So through the process of inquiry learning, they're going to go through the process of concept development. Now, you would want to then have something probably a little bit more structured than just play with this toy. How about use this toy, answer these questions. Oh, okay. Try making volume constant and then seeing what happens. Because part of the gas laws is if you want to just look at two, you have to make one of them constant. So leave them with that. Um, science teachers, Pogel, you guys familiar with that? Process-oriented guided inquiry learning. Absolutely brilliant in terms of the, 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 the process of concept development. So build something like this around the Pogel model. And, and so again, I'm not going to go into the details of that. Okay. But we have an activity now that the kids can engage through inquiry-based learning to develop the concepts of behind Bohr's Law, Charles' Law, and Galen's Law. Okay, so when you're building your, your lesson, now I do all my stuff on a learning management system. All my classes. It's, it, everything is in Moodle. So what I have in there is I'll, I'll have my gas law unit. Okay, and when they get to this objective, I don't know, it's probably gas law objective 2 or 3 or something. Let's just call that, you know, lesson 8.3. Okay. I'm going to have a link to the FET activity, okay. and then I'm going to have a link not to, FET, to my video. Okay. So they're going to do the FET first, and I would probably have a, um, you know, a, a document that they're going to work through as well, and then I'm going to have a link to the video. Okay. So they've got conceptual understanding. Now they need something for, they got to figure out the math. Now you might have a great inquiry-based activity to do the math. You wouldn't even need to use a video. Great. More power to you. I'm not that good. I need to do some direct instruction. So what I'm going to do then is create a quick little video. Um, and um, to do that, I'm going to use some fun software. And a fun little tool. So now we can start talking about tools and software a little bit. And um, so I really, really like these type of things, these little tablet interfaces. It's basically a glorified mouse, but it lets you write. And I find these invaluable because a lot of what I do is very process, very working out problems, very, you need to see someone balance an equation, not just see text in front of a balanced equation. How did a three get there? Well, let me talk you through the process of how that three got there. Okay? Um, you know what? I'm actually going to skip actually making the video. But um, we'll talk more about the, the nuts and bolts of it. So at this point, I would need to sit down and create some sort of instructional video. Okay? Now, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, how long should these videos be? General rule of thumb is one and a half minutes per grade level. That's just kind of what... I think is appropriate. So you've got a second grader, don't give them a 15 minute video, a three minute video. Okay? If you've got a sixth grader, you know, maybe they can do 10 minutes. High schoolers, here's my rule of thumb. Shoot for shoot for 10. They always end up as 12, and I wish they were five minutes long. That's my AP chemistry won't tell you how long those are. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Sorry. Don't hate me. Okay, so um so we have the concept, we have the, the direct instruction to teach them the math. So I would say, okay, here's Boyle's Law, pressure times volume, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Here's your pressure, here's your volume. Let's go through and, and solve this problem as an example. And then they would just kind of learn how the math works. Okay, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. I would do that with Charles' Law, I would do that with Boyle's Law as well. The, um, I think a better question for that then is, um, how are they then going to access this video, and are they going to do it at home, or are they going to all do it in class when they're ready for it? And then that's kind of a bigger picture. Um, again, if you were here this morning or want to go back and watch the, the, the video of this morning's session, if you're just kind of doing Flip Class 101, they're probably all going to watch the video the night before, and then they're all going to come to class, and they're going to do some practice with that. So you would do maybe like the day before, they're going to do the inquiry thing in class. At night, they're going to watch the instructional video, and then in class, they're going to do some application or maybe a lab uh, follow-up. Uh, and so on. But if you have a kind of an asynchronous classroom, which was kind of my phase two of all of this, where my students were just working through the class at a pace that was good for them, and when they're they're working through the through the class and the learning management system, when they get to the gas law unit and unit 
they're going to do the Fed activity. When they're done with that, they're going to watch the video. Then they're going to do some practice. They're going to do the assessment when it's all done. Okay. So just depending on your approach, your students are going to are, are going to get to this stuff at different times. All right. So let's talk. Sorry, I got a bunch of blank slides. Okay. My ten laws of video. And I already talked about the first one. Keep it short. If you can't say it in just a couple minutes, it's probably not worth saying. <laughs> they could probably find it somewhere else that's more concise and better than what you did. Um, gosh, there's something I want to tell you, and I thought about it like 30 seconds ago, and it's, it's like stuck in my brain. It's going to come out. Ah, okay. In terms of the time thing, learn from my mistakes. So all the videos that my students were using last year were version kind of 2.5 of all my videos. So 2007 school year, my colleague and I, we made all the instructional videos for chemistry and AP chemistry in that first year. Now we split up the workload. I did Unit 1 Chem, he did Unit 1 AP Chem. I did Unit 2 AP Chem, he did Unit 2 Chem, and we would trade off back and forth. And my wife had twins, and he did them all for about two months. And then I got back into the swing of things and so on. So, um, gosh, that was a long time ago. My girls are big now. Um, so keep it short. So, but the mistake that we made the first time around is whatever we were doing for direct instruction in class, be that 20 minutes, you know, maybe it was four different concepts. We put all of that on one video. The kids are like, too much, too long. The feedback we got from them is I want one topic, be as short as possible per video. So that's what we did. We went back, we re completely redid all of our curriculum, and we broke everything down into those very discrete learning objectives, and we had one video per learning objective. Now, another mistake we made. Again, I learned the hard way. That's the only way I learned, so learn from my mistakes. Um, we made one video for every single learning objective. Some of them were not good at all. We were looking at things like atomic theory. But we're like, why aren't they getting it? They don't understand. They're just not getting it. We went back and we, we, we kind of rewatched the videos. And we looked at them and we're like, yeah, those were really bad. And it wasn't that they were of bad quality. It's just that particular topic did not lend itself to direct instruction. We're talking these really abstract concepts of how electrons and protons and neutrons relate to each other and something you can't see. And we're trying to, like, you know, doodle it with our digital pen, you know, using these dumb little pictures we pulled off the Internet that, you know, you're trying to find free ones that you actually have license to use and you get some little hack job drawing that somebody made and upload they were just bad. They were not good at all. So we said, okay, those stink. We got to find something else. So we went out and we scoured our resources for inquiry-based activities for them to learn about atomic theory. And lo and behold, the students learned because that particular type of concept lended itself better to inquiry-based learning than to direct instruction. Okay. Now, subsequently, we got involved with TED Ed. You guys know TED? TED Talks. Okay. If you don't know TED Ed, go to ed.ted.com. And they have started animating teachers' lessons. So the first one that they put out, or one of the first ones they put out, was John Bergman, my colleagues, his lesson on how big is an atom. For the first time, that crappy lesson that we've been doing for years was animated by a professional animator and brought to life. And we're like, oh, this is what we've always wanted. But we didn't have the resources to do it until we had you know, professional animators actually do it in conjunction with Ted. And it was amazing. So that... But it's only an introduction to atomic theory, kind of something to inspire the idea, inspire the concept. It is not nuts and bolts details on the interaction between electrons and neutrons and protons. It's a big picture kind of relating how it works. There's another one that we always did live in our classrooms is how to get a date for the prom. And it has to do with chemical kinetics. So lo and behold, that's one we tried to make a video. We tried four different, four different times to create this video, and it was always horrible. It was awful. Guess what I submitted for my TED Ed project? How to get a date for a prom. How a professional animator do it, and it's amazing. It's really, really cool, and it finally conveys that concept to my students. But again, it's not a nuts and bolts. It's kind of a big picture, let's inspire you to want to learn more. Okay? So let's back up a little bit. In terms of using video, again, not real great for the concept stuff unless you can use something really, really awesome to inspire your kids to want to learn more. So, you know, if you can have professional educators or professional animators do that. However, there are some people who are taking kind of a smaller scale approach. So in order to inspire their students ahead of time, they're doing um, video story problems. So there's 
teacher in uh, in uh, Michigan. His name is Ben Rhymes, who's just kind of the master of this. Um, and he basically takes his video camera wherever he goes, and so he walks into a shopping mall. There's this gigantic like marble thing, and there's water coming out from underneath it. And his two-year-old daughter just sits and she's spinning the marble, right? This thing probably weighs four tons. And, he, and so he's filmed the thing, just films his daughter for about 15 seconds, turns the camera on herself, and he says, all right, this thing probably weighs four tons. Why can my two-year-old spin it? Come to class with an answer or, or uh, an explanation. That's their homework. So they come to class. So he didn't use the video as, a, as to teach a bunch of stuff. He used it to inspire them to get the ideas going. Then they talked about friction and fluids and stuff like that. Then that led into the lesson. So that's another good place uh, for instructional video. Then that led into the concepts. And then he does the math with them as well. And he has an instructional video there. Either way, keep it short. Uh, if you are making your own uh, videos, which I recommend you do, and we can talk a bit, a bit about that later, is um, you got to animate your voice. My first year of doing this, it was hard because my wife had twins, right? So we didn't sleep much. And uh, it was usually like, okay, we're starting Unit 5 tomorrow, and my students need all of their Unit 5 videos, and I haven't made them yet. So let's go down to the laundry room at 11 o'clock at night with my computer and my tablet and crank out all the Unit 5 videos. Now, you know, by about the video number four, I'm getting a little punchy. You know, just getting a little goofy, you know, getting to the bottom of that glass of wine doesn't help matters either. So, um, it, uh, it was easy to animate my voice the, the deeper I get into it. But then I realized that those ones are actually a little more engaging, where I wasn't just telling them the stuff, blah, 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 divide by two, and then you move it. I was like, ah, just animating my voice, getting a little goofy, and it kept the kids engaged a little more than if I was just delivering regular content. Then we figured out that working with a partner was a much better approach. So after one year of making all these chemistry and AP chemistry videos, we said, all right, next year let's redo all the AP chem, and then the year after that we're going to redo all the chem. And uh, we had the good fortune of uh, sharing a student teacher that year. So we had a one-hour block of time every single day that we both didn't have a class. And so you know what we did? We cranked out video like you would not believe that year. All we did was make video. And we did them together. On a whim one time, we did one together. And the kids were like, oh, you guys should do them together all the time. We're like, yeah, well, we can't. We're not the common planning period. All the, time. the next year we did, so we did. We just started making videos. We did them together. And it really created an interesting dynamic. It was no longer just dissemination of content. It was a conversation about the stuff that the kids needed to learn. One of the things that we discovered was if one of us played the idiot and the other one played the expert, that it really... It, it, it did a lot to, uh, to prevent some of these misconceptions taking root. Because one of us would ask all the stupid questions that anyone watching probably wanted to ask or any kid in class would, would ask. And, and we knew that if they didn't ask, the, if someone didn't ask that stupid question, that it would lead to some sort of misconception. We've been doing this long enough. We knew what the misconceptions were. And lo and behold, it worked. We were having way fewer misconceptions about some of these things because we, we dealt with them by one of us asking that question. Um, so split up the workload, work with a partner, it helps. Now, if you're the only person at your school and you don't have a partner on site, guess what? You can record a Google Plus Hangout. There are two English teachers. One of them lives in California, one of them lives in uh, North Carolina, who are currently making instructional content videos together from California and North Carolina remotely. And they use Google Plus Hangout to do that, and they just record it. It's pretty cool. Um, know your audience. so. Um, you know, be a little goofy, be a little stupid. We, John and I, we have these running jokes in our videos. So, I mean, there's one, he, he's like exploring how to, all these different musical instruments. So every day he's like, you know, scratching away at his daughter's violin or banging on a drum. And I just make fun of him all the time. So, again, we have high school students, they understand that, but we can get a little goofy sometimes. Um, another one, we have this, this Einstein wig. We had a webcam on. So we start out and I'm wearing the wig, right? And then we just pause the recording real fast and don't move, and then we put it on the other guy's head, and we just continue as if nothing ever happened. So the wig, throughout the video, it just pops back and forth between our heads. And what's going on? It's just dumb little stuff like that, but it's, it keeps them engaged. But the problem with humor is you don't want to waste your kids' time. Um, we get a little goofy, but our students know that like, that first kind of one minute is usually a throwaway where we're just telling stupid jokes and just you know talking about horrible stuff. If I, if I was still in the classroom... Um, and I was going to redo these, I, I would probably eliminate that component because it is a waste of their, of their time. It's a waste of a minute of their life, and that adds up over time. So, um, so 
know your balance. Uh, there was one uh, group of teachers, a husband and wife team, they taught earth science in Denver. And um, uh, my colleague John was working with them to, to share content. They used the same textbook. They're like, okay, I'll do these chapters. You guys do those ones, and we'll just share and swap and cut and paste and whatever. They spent eight minutes one, in one video talking about the Denver Broncos. And that was fine on Tuesday when, you know, Monday Night Football was important, or, you know, that, that week. But if they ever use that video again, especially like the next year, it's like, who cares? And if anyone at Pittsburgh watches, they're like, we don't like the Broncos here. So I was like, what's the point? You know, so well, that was a big for me when I came out here. Like this whole, like, cult of Pittsburgh sports. It's crazy. I'm like, oh, man. But I saw Colorado plates on my car. First game of the season this year when Denver beat the Steelers. Oh, my gosh, my, my car doesn't get trash. It's, it's a little scary. So, it's all right. I'm PA plates now. All right. Annotations. Um, there are lots of example videos that, that I can show you and share with you, and uh, one of which in the Classroom Salon site is just a compilation of a bunch of video that a bunch of teachers have done uh, across the country. And you'll see that a lot of them are using these digital pen devices to mark them up. Now, if you have an a interactive whiteboard in your classroom, you can just grab the pen and go. Whatever's on the screen gets recorded. So uh, you don't have to have a tablet if you already have a, a smart board or for me, if you know, whatever. Um, you can just pick up the pen and go. But annotations are, are, are big for me because they bring a real-time element to it. It's not just something static that's on the screen. It's you drawing and talking through your thought process at the time. So I think that's really important. Um, another thing that we do a lot of is we uh, bring video clips into our videos. Now, video clips into videos. It seems redundant. But what I'm talking about is a video camera clip of me somewhere in the world, and then I throw that into the middle of my lesson that I'm teaching using a screen, uh, screen capture. Okay? So I just take my video camera wherever, and if I see something interesting that looks like it's kind of chemistry-ish, I shoot it. I've got probably 30 hours of footage that I'll probably never use because eh, some were okay, some were interesting, some were not. But like I was in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago, and I went to the Smithsonian, and I'm like, oh, cool, hope diving. Covalent network solids. Okay, let's talk about that. And I just throw them in my videos and let my kids watch them. And you know, I, I was at, up in Canada, and I saw these little, those little bugs that float on top of the water. And they were scooting across. I'm like, oh, cool, surface tension lesson. And I just shot that, and then you know, myself, and we'll talk about surface tension. And so I just I try to bring the world to my students. A lot of my students, when I was in Colorado, they never really left that area. They just stayed there. They don't travel. They don't get out. They don't see the world. So I, I love to travel. I, I get around a lot. So I brought the world with my kids. So that was kind of fun. Uh, picture in picture. To webcam or not to webcam? It's a hard decision. Um, my first version of my videos was just a recording of what was on my screen and my voice. That was it. On a whim, threw in a webcam one day, and the kids were like, I like that. You're not just a disembodied voice. You're my teacher. Okay? Um, had breakfast with Sal Khan of Khan Academy back in May. He said, I don't put the webcam on because I don't want to be a distraction. I said, I put the webcam on because my kids like it. We chatted about it a little bit, concluded two things. We have two different audiences. My audience is my students. I make my videos for my kids. They need to know that I am their teacher. They have a connection with me. They need to see me. He's making videos for the world, for everyone, most of whom will probably never meet him or, or speak to him. They have no real-world connection with him, so it's better for him to get out of the way and let the content do its thing. Different audience, different product, basically. So different conclusion. My students, though, overwhelmingly said, I want the picture or picture, and picture. I want your face on the screen so you're not just a disembodied voice. Call-outs and zooms, you can use some editing tools to, uh, you know, really in, in, enhance and uh, reinforce what, uh, what you're doing on your screen. So, um, you know, zoom in on the screen, call, um, put little pop-ups, uh, just depending on what software you're using to make your videos, you may or may not have those features, but I think they're, they're valuable when we talk about that. Uh, something I, th I think is very important is keep these things copyright friendly. Uh, know what acceptable use is for uh, pictures, for videos, for anything that you're putting into your stuff, especially if you're not putting it behind a password. Now, if you're putting it behind a password just for your classroom use, there are different rules that apply there than if you're putting it out for the world to consume. Okay, classroom acceptable usage is different than other. It doesn't mean you have carte blanche to do whatever you want with somebody else's stuff, but the rules are different. So, um, so just be nice. Um, our, my first set of videos, I mean, we're teachers, right? What do we do? We beg, borrow, we steal. Okay. Oh, shoot. I didn't plan uh, the night before. Um, I need, uh, you go online, you do a quick search for a PowerPoint on the topic that you're doing, you download that sucker and you use it. Right? We've all done that in a pinch. And then you have stuff like that floating around in your computer. And then you edit it next year. Oh, that wasn't great. I'm going to change it. But then you're like, well, where did that picture come from? Where did the original come from? Who knows where it came from? 
My first version was filled with stuff that I'd been using for six years prior and John had been using for 20 years. We had no idea where any of those pictures came from. They were not copyright friendly. So what do we do? Version two, we, we, went th we went through all of our slideshows. We said, okay, this picture, we need to find a free public you know, public domain equivalent, you know, go through Creative Commons, all that stuff to find something that we can use and modify and make money on if we ever chose to sell these, which we did, ultimately. Um, so, be careful. Okay. So, three big questions that always come up, again, as we're talking about using video as instructional tools. is Who makes the videos? How do you make videos? And where do you post the videos? I conduct one and two day workshops based entirely around these three questions. So it would take a long time to like get people up and running, but let me give you a few uh, resources to look at with that. Okay, first off is who makes these videos? Is there any benefit to you making your own content video when you could just as easily go on YouTube and find one that somebody else has made? Good question. A lot of teachers are going, do not want, do not want to make video, don't want my face out there, I don't like the technology, can't do it. Maybe that's, maybe that's you, maybe that, that's not a good choice for you. So, I think it's best if you make your own, and here's why. One of which is content standards. State standards in Pennsylvania are different than state standards in Colorado, which are different than state standards in Massachusetts, which are different, state, different than state standards in Virginia. You might be really bound, depending on your school district or state, as to what you can and cannot teach and how much you can deviate from that. You're, you know what your kids are going to need in terms of content. But you also know what your kids are going to need in terms of context. Okay, My kids in the mountains perceive the world differently than kids in the middle of the city, which is different. I've lived in both locations, and I'm still the same person, but my perspective is very different, just depending on kind of where I'm at. So I make my videos for my students. You should make your videos for your students. You know what their learning needs are. You know what your population is. If most of your kids are below reading level, you're going to make an instructional video different than if most of your kids are above reading level. It's just simply the nature of how that works. Now, it's not to say you can't find something else that would be appropriate for the kids, but I really think there's benefit of the teacher making it for their students because, again, it's that connection with the webcam, my teacher, your voice. There's a connection that I have with you that I don't have with anybody else. Is it essential? No. Is it preferred? Yes. What do I base that on? Any more than a gut feeling? Feedback that I'm getting all over the place. Talking to teachers who are using videos, instructional tools, I said, yeah, you know what, Aaron? I started out and I used all of your chemistry videos. And they were a million times better, and mine aren't great, they were a million times better than the ones I could have made, but my kids demanded that I make my videos because they wanted me to do it, because I, they wanted a video that was made for them, not for some kids in Colorado. Like, oh, cool. And I, I hear that constantly from teachers and from students when I talk to them. So an entry point might be, go use videos from X video repository. Then as you find, this video is really not meeting the needs of my students. Remove, make, make your own. This video is not meeting my needs. Remove, insert my own, but use these other ones that are still out there. Sure. Especially, they're like, oh, wow, you're, you're, like, you're making this for us? That's pretty cool. The interesting thing, though, is the novelty factor wore off after about two weeks. Um, they're like, yeah, because after about two weeks, I mean, early on, it's like, oh, this is neat, novel news, something that, you know, my other teachers aren't doing. And after that, it's like, it's a video. We watch YouTube all the time. This isn't special. It is not. It's not special, but it's the way that they interact with the world. You know, you said it in your session earlier that um, if you want to learn how to, how to fix your brakes, you go to YouTube and you learn how to fix your brakes. I had a snowblower problem a couple years ago. I went to YouTube, typed in the model number, found a complete breakdown and rebuild of my snowblower, along with diagnostic videos of how to, how to learn how to fix it. It's what we do now if we want to learn something. So there is value, I think, in, in making your own for your own students. It's not essential, but I think there's value. Okay, how do you make the videos? I'll talk a little bit about this, but um, I'm, I'm going to go out to Dan Spencer's website. Um, Dan Spencer lives in Michigan. He was a classroom teacher. Uh, he is now uh, kind of a district level technology integration specialist. You can follow him on Twitter, RunFarDBS. He's a very uh, active Twitterer. Uh, oh, I can see him this weekend. Um, 
here is a short link to his website. So he has probably the best, most comprehensive flipped classroom, flipped learning resource list I've ever found. It's a, it's a publicly available Google Doc. Um, so let's see, we've got capital F, H, lowercase u, H, capital X, if you can't see that from where you're at. But tons and tons of resources in terms of what are some... allowed me and anyone else to share this so you can you can uh, spread the word um, so he has some, some tech stuff some quotes from some of my colleagues uh, okay so here's my 20 minute video something from Dan here with me again um, my colleague John student created content if you haven't seen mathtrain.tv you should go there Eric Marcos is great um, uh, flip professional development, if you're a, a, a learning coach or a PD person, um, part of our nonprofit is to develop the concept of professional development using this instructional model. And uh, Kristen is up in uh, Minnesota, and she's a master at this. So um, lots of great stuff from her. Um, there's articles that many people have written, some YouTube uh, presentations, and so on. So, okay, here we go. Equipment. What do you need? You need a computer with some screencasting software. Now, some people are a little intimidated by that. They're like, what is screencasting software, for one? And two, I don't like my computer. Okay. This is a technology conference. So I'm going to assume that most of you are somewhat comfortable using some computing devices. Um, sometimes when I'm not at technology conferences, people are like, I hate computers. So great. Guess what? You have a video camera in your pocket. I have seen, literally, people have taken their iPhone and they have duct taped it to like a, a tripod, and they're using it as a document camera to record them writing stuff underneath the whiteboard. And that is their entry point into using video as an instructional tool. More power to you. Awesome. Glad you're making this, that, that, it, that, that transition in there. Um, now that, sorry, I'm getting my microphone. Now that uh, iPads are becoming more prevalent and other tablet devices, there are lots of um, inking tools, whiteboarding tools that will also record what you're writing on your screen. Um, I'm pretty sure he has some, some links uh, to some of the iPad apps that are out there as well. Um, that's a very easy thing to uh, just record a, you know, just an ad hoc little session with your kids. Oh, you know, you're struggling with this, with this problem. Let me fire up the, the iPad. I'm going to work out the problem for you. And because you're like the ninth person I've had to ask this question to. So I'm going to archive this session. I'm going to post it to our, our Moodle site, our LMS for the class. So that next time I go, you know what, watch that first. I'm going to go help them and I'm going to come back and I'm going to answer your question. So you can refer them to the resource that you made because that was the ninth person and you're the tenth. Well, guess what? The tenth. Now you have to you have to watch the, the, the tutorial and then I'll come back and answer your questions. And then it's a two minute conversation instead of a ten minute conversation. So I mean, there's only one of you and you got thirty kids in your room. You can only spread yourself so thin. So use what you can to to maximize that that resource. In fact, what's the most valuable use of face to face time with those kids? My contention is that's talking to all the kids one on one. But again, you have to be efficient with that as well. All right, now, so if you want to get a little little bigger step up than duct taping a camera to, uh, you know, or duct taping your phone to a, to a tripod, a computer with screencasting software is a lot of people are, are going in, and we'll get down to what those are here in a second. Some sort of presentation software is what a lot of people are using. So something with the slideshow, a PowerPoint, Keynote, um, Smart Notebook, Promethean, whether they're flip, Flipbook, whatever they're called for their interactive whiteboard. Again, what's that? Their flip charts, yes, thank you. So again, whatever sort of thing you have for a presentation, that's a good, pl good place to start. But it doesn't have to be a presentation. You may need to navigate a website and teach your kids how to do that. Hi kids, here's how you're going to use our learning management system this year. Click, click here, click here, type your name in here, click here, and here's where all the resources are. There's a three minute video. So I'm, I'm building online classes for a place that has never done any sort of online or distance education. And I had a little tutorial I just made on the other day on, for the new students, here's how you log in, and here's where you get to go to, to enroll in these classes. That kind of stuff. So clicking, you know, click tutorials is sometimes they're often called. So that's a great place to start. Microphones are handy. Um,
because you need high quality audio. The most important part of a good video is good audio. You can have really mediocre video as, as long as they can hear you, but if you have awesome, like high definition video and a horrible microphone, it's completely unusable. It doesn't matter how good the video is, if the audio stinks, it's unusable. But you can have mediocre video with a good, audio, with a good microphone. So, um, get a decent microphone. So, there's lots of options out there. I've got kind of a tabletop one that I just I went to a BH photo. It's like that big electronics photo and stuff out of New York. I just typed in podcasting microphone. This nice USB tabletop with a stand, pops about 100 bucks, something like that. Another good one a lot of people use is called a Blue Snowball. I think they're 60 bucks. It's a little bit cheaper. And you can just plunk it on the table, and uh, multiple people can talk to it without having to be too terribly close. But it does a really good job. It's a good entry point. A lot of uh, webcams have great built-in mics. My Mac has a great built-in um, uh, microphone. Incidentally, I used to have the exact same computer that's it's sitting on top of right now in my classroom, and it was bad. I mean, that was... It, it, Unusable audio. The quality was so poor, so I had to get a, an external microphone. Beware, though, if you're using an internal mic, if you ever need to do any typing, <laughs> if you need to do any clicking, it really picks that up. So an external microphone is beneficial for that. If you need mobility, maybe you're recording live. Maybe you don't want to pre-record, but you just want to archive what you're already doing in your classroom. One, I recommend a wireless tablet that you can write on. Um, this particular one is uh, made by Wacom. It's a bamboo. It has this nifty little. If I can get to it. it has this nifty little wireless uh, adapter that you buy and you just install it right there. It's a few extra bucks, but it's worth it. You just plug the little uh, little dongle in your USB port and you can you're mobile. You're not tethered to a USB cable anymore. So those are cool. But and you can get a, like a, a little wireless microphone. It doesn't have to be like a fancy lapel mic. Um, I know a lot of teachers that are just using. Don't have it. It's charging in my house. It's a little Bluetooth headset that you'd use for a phone. Sync it to your computer, and you can you can walk around the room with that. Now there's a limited range, so be careful. And a Bluetooth can get a little interference, but just find something wireless. We're talking 30, 40 bucks. Um, a, a tablet for annotating. We've talked about that. So your you know your walk up bamboos are fairly cheap, or your um, slates that the those interactive whiteboard people put out are helpful as well. Um, let's see. Okay, then you need a place to keep your videos. Where are you going to post the videos? So, obviously a popular spot is YouTube. But what's the problem with putting all your videos on YouTube? Probably block at your school. Right. Now, YouTube is coming out with, you know, YouTube for schools, YouTube for teachers, and stuff like that. So, the filtering is different. So, you're not going to get the, if you like this video, you might like this. And there's 18 videos and you have no idea what's going to show up on there. Yeah, I've, my kids have been watching this stuff before, and it's like, my, my own children. It's like, okay, you know, it pops up to me, and you're like, okay, let's uh, go do something else, because I'm, I really wish you hadn't seen that. But, um, uh, yeah, so there's lots of options. So, you know, teacher tube, school tube is another one. Um, some schools choose to host them internally uh, on your own servers. That has a whole other, you know, load of baggage that goes with them if you want to do that. Um, Let's see, what are some, you know, Vimeo is another option. Um, the people who make uh, Camtasia Studio, a company called TechSmith, they have a place called screencast.com. There's a free free account and a pay account, but they have like five or six levels of privacy. So you can have a public, publicly searchable. You can have it where you have to have the URL, or you can have it where you have to have a password, and, or you have it completely private where nobody can get to it. So definitely way different levels of security there. Um, that's where I put all of my stuff. Um, and then that'll also generate an RSS feed where you can access your iTunes if you want to do it that way as well. So if you don't know what that is, talk to me later. Um, and then a learning management system of some sort. I really recommend this, even if you're not going to do anything with video. Just I just like learning management systems. They're a handy way to organize your classroom. So um, my go-to has been Moodle, uh, just because that's what my district had set up. They didn't want to pay for uh, other commercial ones. They wanted to uh, just host it internally for uh, control issues as well, and that's what we use. Um, I continue to use Moodle. I have my own Moodle space, and I, I just like it. I just, I just like it. Um, but there are a bunch of other ones as well, so you don't have to do that. If your district, your district probably already has one. Even if you're not using it, it's probably there. Most districts have something set up that they're at least exploring. So just a good place to post, post things. Definitely an increasingly popular one is Edmodo. You can go next door right now if you would like to catch the tail end of that presentation. You're more than welcome. That's fine. Um, okay, I'm going to stop talking about that, talk about a little bit more specific. Um, okay, a couple of tools. So, kind of the, 
most popular and probably the most complex screencasting tool is Camtasia Studio. You can get it for PC or Mac. Um, don't pay retail. They have education pricing that you can. It's the Mac version. I think is about 100 bucks, and I think the PC version is 150 ish. And if you buy like more licenses for your school, it gets cheaper. I don't know. I talk to them. Um, they're awesome people. They 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 have great discounts for educators. They really believe in education, and they you know, find So um, they're awesome. Um, they also make a free product called Jing. Um, you have a limit to uh, five minutes with Jing, and then they have to post to screencast.com, and you can't do any editing. So some people are like, oh, that's a nice, easy entry point, because I, I don't want to do any editing. That's way too complicated for me. So Jing is a great place to start. It records whatever's on your screen and your audio the end. And it limits you to five minutes, so it keeps you from being long-winded. So it's handy. Um, Snagit, also made by the same people. Um, it's... Uh, I think 60 bucks. It used to just be a, uh, a, a picture, like screen image capture, but they just incorporated a video component with the last version. Uh, it has unlimited time, but again, no editing features. So a few more limitations, but that's also a good entry point for people who don't want all the editing options here. Um, ScreenFlow is a completely different product, not made by these people. It's only for Mac. It's very similar to Camtasia, but it's a really, really slick uh, screencasting program. Um, the latest version of uh, QuickTime, I think, will do some screen recording. Um, I think there's a Windows version that will do some screen recording as well, and they're okay. Um, I, I haven't used them much, to be honest, because I've been using these ones for years. I don't want to learn a new piece of software. So there's probably other ones out there. New ones pop up all the time. Um, so this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's just stuff that I've found to be handy. If you want web-based, maybe you're at your in-law's house for Thanksgiving, and you realize, oh, shoot, I need to make a quick lesson, and you didn't bring your laptop that has you know, Camtasia Studio on it, guess what? Screencastomatic.com has a web-based screen recording, screen recorder built in. You fire up your browser, it turns Java on, and it records whatever's on your screen and your voice and a webcam. And it's free. It's really, really, really slick. I know a lot of people that are liking that. Um, uh, Screener is another free one. I haven't used that one nearly as much as Screencastomatic, but it works similarly. Um, and I'm not going to have time to go into all these, but you can go to Dan's link and check those all out. Um, okay, now where are you going to put your videos? That's key because um, these places to put them, screencast.com, YouTube, and Vimeo, and TeachTube, all these places, they're, they're great and all. But the cool thing is, um, again, we're, we're, we're building these sessions today using a Classroom Salon. And Classroom Salon can, can take any YouTube or this new Vimeo as well, YouTube or Vimeo video, and you can build a lesson and, uh, and a discussion around uh, any uh, YouTube or Vimeo video. So if it's out there, you can, uh, you can build that lesson around uh, Classroom Salon, around any of those videos uh, there. So I put mine, my students access them here, but all my videos are also on YouTube, just so I can do things like that. And I can also just put those out for the world. Um, I, I have slightly different versions on screencast.com for my students than I do for the world because of copyright issues. I taught AP Chemistry, and um, I had some, uh, some, of, uh, some of their old questions, like the text printed, and then I would work out a solution for my students. Probably five or six of them over the course of my curriculum. And I uh, just got an email from them one day. I said, hey, I just you know, found your videos. Just wanted to know if you have any of our AP chemist, any of the text of our, of our stuff in your videos. I'm like, gosh, I don't know. So we went through all of our, like all the documents we had to go with. And we're like, oh, we do. We did six of them. I'm like, okay. So we went through. We edited those sections out real fast. re rendered the videos and re-uploaded them. Took the other ones down and responded to the email. No, we do not. Honestly. <laughs> so, but my students, I can use those for my students behind a password. So I have them behind a password here. They're out for public consumption here without any copyrighted material. Oops. So just, you know, when you get the cease and desist order, cease and desist, and change. Didn't get that far. Um, okay. So again, we talked about, you know, there's Moodle and Blackboard and Edmodo and Schoology. And we've got Classroom Salon coming out now. Lots of different choices there. Um, so I'm not going to go through all that, but uh, we're going to go back to. All right, so we talked about posting the videos, and I'm just really going long here. Sorry, I have to talk less. I get so excited. All right, um, so again, more resources at fliplearning.org. That's my nonprofit, and lots of um, things coming up. Shameless self promotion. My book just came out in June. You're welcome to buy it. It's a quick read, it's about 100 pages. You can read it in a weekend. It's a concept book, big picture, kind of art, John and my story. Not, not so much a how to, nuts and bolts. Um, that's coming out, book two, we're working on that right now. Um, join our network, flipclassroom.org, uh, about, like I said, 10,000 teachers sharing ideas. 
Uh, if you're interested, we do have some webinars coming up uh, through our, our uh, flipperlearning.org subject area and um, like administrator specific. So if you're interested in any of those, you can sign up at flipperlearning.org. Those are being uh, done in conjunction with Cisco and text messaging. Um, again, you don't have to write all those down. It's not a quiz. Um, one day workshops, let's see. Those are done. There's one in Illinois, the Chicago area. Um, our annual conference is this summer in June in Stillwater, Minnesota. We're probably going to have it in Pittsburgh in 2014. We're exploring that option right now. So if you don't want to go to Minnesota, you can uh, hold out to 2014. Uh, we're exploring some options right now as to how we can do it here. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah, so more, more of these one-day regional workshops. will be. I'm, we'll be doing some in the Pennsylvania area here pretty soon. I've been really swamped and haven't had a chance to set one up yet, but uh, that's coming. Um, okay, I will shut up now. Okay, again, go to the salon. Make sure you make some comments. View some of the videos. Um, you know, have your colleagues uh, check those out. Um, Ananda brought some uh, flyers explaining what Classroom Salon is and how it works. And then I will be on Salon over the next few weeks responding to questions, responding to comments, responding to concerns about the model, um, whatever. Um, so that's going to be a good place for us to continue this conversation. Um, and then if, but if you just want to contact me privately, you can email me. I have not been very active on Twitter. I've been you know, moving and changing careers and whatnot, and that kind of tends to be a life suck for me. It like, sucks all my emotional energy. My wife's like, yeah, you need to play with the kids. So I do that. <laughs> okay. We, not a lot of time for questions. I'll tell you what, I'll stick around and answer any questions that you have. I'm happy to do that, but if you want to get off to the next, uh, uh, there's a closing session at 2.30, 2 is that right? Yeah, I should probably do that because it is at 2.30 right now. Anyhow, thank you for coming, and thanks for having me. We'll, uh, I'll be around. I do have some cards if you need, to, if you just want to follow up with me later as well. Huh? This one or Dan's? Dan's. Let me put Dan's up here.